Okay then, let's get into things. So last time we talked about the fact that you can create your own user-defined exceptions, and we'll go through some examples of that today. Um, but when you create a function, you can declare what type of ex exceptions you expect to throw. Um, so if you declare a function, after you do your function definition, you can attach on throw, and then you can list a series of types of the possible things that you can throw. You know, for example, you might have my fun. It could possibly throw an out of range error or a logic error or any other type of thing that you might throw. Uh, if a function will never throw an exception, you can proceed it at the end with no throw. And if you ever inherit from a function that has said that it's going to throw something or not throw something, that's part of the signature. So you have to include that in the override of that method as well. Now, from all the things, though, that I've been reading, it's recommended that you never do this uh, and actually declare in uh, C++ what can be thrown, but you put that instead in your documentation. Uh, this is because the, um, the, the throw specifications aren't like fully supported everywhere that they should be, and the compiler doesn't really do anything to enforce these rules. So you could have an exception that you say, well, I'm only going to throw out of range errors and logic errors. And you could potentially throw something else. So like I throw a Bob error. The compiler does not check for that at compile time. So it's still possible you could throw anything. And if you happen to throw something that's not listed, what happens is undefined. And so the behavior is kind of like, I don't know what's going to happen. So it's recommended that you list in your documentation what can be thrown. Have, read, have users read that, but you don't actually attach it in the specifications of the function declaration. Does that make sense? I think it's weird that it's there. It was good intentions, but it's not really supported enough, or not enough is done by the compiler to actually make it a worthwhile feature to use. <coughs> Excuse me. Any questions? No, so the, the no throw doesn't mean that, you know, basically the no throw means that nothing can go wrong necessarily in this function, so you wouldn't throw anything. Um, or you're just guaranteeing the promise that you wouldn't throw something. Perhaps, you know, if something goes wrong, instead you return a value to signify that something went, went wrong instead of throwing an exception. Or it just may not be possible for, you know, this function to throw an exception. Um, for example, you might have a function that's like squares a number, right? If the user is able to give you a number, is there anything that can go wrong in here? No. So you could, you know, theoretically declare that function as being no throw, but again, it's still recommended that you don't. Hmm? Uh, no throw means you won't throw an exception. Oh, did I? I may have written it incorrectly. So let's see. Uh, matrix homework. Oh, because I mistyped. Red. Anything else? Okay. Uh, so some tips are to always use references when capturing an exception. This will make sure that if you capture a child type exception with your parent reference, you don't discard anything. So whenever you catch an exception, it should always be caught by reference, not by value. You don't want to create a copy of it. The other thing is you want to be wary of storing pointers or references in your exception because it's very possible that your exception outlives the thing that it points to or refers to. For example, you know, you might have your <clears throat> matrix class or something or your vector class throw an exception for indexing out of bounds, right? And you might be like, well, I can just store the reference to the matrix that I tried to access incorrectly. And then I can report that in my exception. This may not work correctly because that object may not be alive by the time uh, your exception is being evaluated. 
So you probably want to copy some information from the object or maybe copy the entire object because it's going to be you know, captured inside of yourself and live as long as you live. So that's just a really subtle error and a really easy mistake to make because you know, your value might not still be around anymore. Um, an example of this might be to In this example, will this vector v be alive inside of this exception handler down here? Will it still exist? So in here, you know, in this section of code, can I access v? No, why not? How long does v last till? The end of these closed parentheses. So again, if this exception tried to capture any information from v, and then try to access it inside of its what method, then we'd have issues because V does not exist anymore when we're here in the error handler. That's why you probably never want to capture a reference or, um, or a pointer to object that you're working with that through the exception. It's not guaranteed there's still gonna be a lot anymore. Does that make sense? So watch out. And then let's you know, pop back over here to our toddler. So over here we have our fit class and fit inherits from exception. So what I've done is I've created an error string that's gonna store my error. And then in my what method, I need to report what the error is. So here is fit.cpp. So my what just returns error string.c underscore stir. Uh, you can notice that what needs to return a character pointer, a pointer to a C string. If you have a STD string, you can get the corresponding street C string by doing dot C underscore stir. And then over here, when I create my exception, I figure out what my error string should be supposed to be. And the error string is going to like, you know, get the toddler's name and say through a fit when they were given this object, turn that object into a string. So like, you know, you gave the kid a spanking, they're gonna throw a fit because you gave them a spanking or whatever. Over here we have huge fit. It inherits from its parent fit, right? And then again, now it just says they threw a huge fit instead. But notice I rely on my parents dot what in this function and I don't override it. I'm just gonna use what my parent does, which is just to write out whatever this error string is. Any questions so far on our exceptions? So then over here we have our toddler object. <coughs> Excuse me. So you're able to give the toddler different objects and then they become, you know, they do different things. And sometimes if you give them things they, they don't like, Right? They throw a fit, right? So they throw that exception. Any questions here about throwing the exception when the child's given something they don't like? <coughs> Man, sorry. So over here we have something that you haven't seen before. It's called an enum class. And an enum class is a way of creating an object that can only take on a certain set of values. So if you ever have something like where you're hard coding something, you know, like player win equals one, player loss equals two, tie game equals three, 
right? You're doing like just different hard-coded numbers. That's when you're going to want to use an enum class instead. So over here, I list all the possible values that an object can take. And so back here, you saw them, that the way to access the values of the object, oops, is back here in toddler. So, you know, in the case that the, get a toy, right? So we're comparing whether object was equal to toy, then we're able to, you know, that they broke your toy. Or if the object was equal to candy. This is just, oh gosh, this is no white space there. Right, it's a little bit easier to read then. Right, that's how you're able to like create an instance of that class. You just say object name colon colon value. Um, an object class or an enum class is pretty much limited to just having values inside of it. It can't have methods, so it can only you know, be these things and it can't be anything else. Uh, I also have this method defined in the same class that converts a object right into a string so that I can print it out easier. Do you guys have any questions on enum classes? Yeah. So candy is one of the values that an object can be, right? So you can have object colon colon candy is a value of type object, I guess. What really happens behind the scenes is that uh, the object maps each one of these uh, values over into an integer variable. So candy right now is zero, vegetables is one, toy is two, spanking is three, and lesson is four. If you want it to give a different value, you can say like underlying value is like, oh, well, vegetables should equal to 89. And now we're going to use 89 for vegetables instead of using one. But it really is just a stand in for a number. Um, so that's why you can't really do anything like too complicated with it. But it gives you a more meaningful way of representing this information than using integers everywhere. Um, a function that accepts an object cannot directly accept an integer. So if I try to pass into a function that wanted an object and I pass an 89, even though vegetables and 89 are the same, the compiler is not going to allow that implicit conversion from 89 to vegetables, so it would fail. But I could do an explicit conversion where I could like static cast the value 89 into an object and then it would be mapped over to vegetables. Um, some other examples of like where you might use this might be like, okay, we have like a stoplight. The stoplight can have what colors? Red, green, yellow. Right, so there's a finite set of values, so you might have like an enum class for the light color. You should have the values red, green, or yellow. Or you might have like the points on the compass. It could be north, south, east, and west. So again, a finite set of values that could exist. Nothing else, nothing more. So you would have that as an enum class. Yes, object is a user-defined name. It can be whatever I feel like. So like an example of maybe like where we should have used this before was if when we were doing our AIs for the, the different types of players, right? We had like a, we said like, oh, well, one is going to be a player, two is going to be an AI. Maybe we should have like player type or you have like, you know, human AI or, human or um, uh, AI. And then we can have that mapped out to values for us instead of just using like these arbitrary concepts. So then back here, over here in main, so we create a toddler Bob, right? We then call extra with spanking, and then we're able to catch a fit out here. So if something goes wrong inside this function that's not caught, right? If some type of fit happens, then we're able to report whatever the error is. Over here, an extra, which is like really like, like nested. So we have a try statement. This try statement will catch any huge fits. This try statement is now nested inside of this try statement, and notice that we have multiple catches that come after it. So doing these try catches can make things kind of ugly. So we try, right, to give the toddler an object, and if we're able to successfully give it to them, we say that they're happy. But in the case where they catch, we catch a huge fit from doing this operation, you're going to say we comforted the toddler. And then we rethrow the exception again you know to do something interesting so now right if we enter the huge fit right and we throw again 
this guy would catch it right here and say we did something. And then none of these would run. So if we just throw a fit, right, and not a huge fit, this is going to be the error handler that's run. And we just say that we ignore them. Here we can catch some something of some type standard exception. And we can just say, hey, I got in some unknown exception. I don't know what it is. Here's the error. We do catch dot dot dot. That means I caught something, but I have no idea what it is. So I'm probably having a lot of problems at this point in time. And then if the exception ever gets thrown outside of this guy down here, we will catch it down here at the bottom and then it'll work out. So let's say we give Bob over here a spanking. Right, we can see that we comforted Bob and we did something, right? Which would be this line of code right here because a huge fit was caught again. And then we also were able to catch the huge fit here and then rethrow it. Why wasn't this line of code down here run? Yeah. It again yeah the outer catch right we caught it already right here and so it was handled so if we get rid of this uh, exception right here and then we try again hopefully I knocked out everything I needed to so we comforted Bob right we did right here then we threw an exception again there was no handler to catch this inside the current function. And so down here we caught it here and we caught a fit reference because a huge fit is a fit. We're able to catch a reference to the child type and then we reported it's what, which is that the, you know, they were given a huge, they threw a huge fit when they, were given, when they were given a spanking. Now, one thing that's a little bit weird about this example is most of the time you would not have a uh, try catch and on the own error that you're throwing, right? So normally, like here, right, we're trying to give them something, right? And then if something goes wrong, you have the catch. That's a little bit unique in just this toy example to show you how to use things. Um, but normally, you would check for some error and then just throw it, which is probably what's happening back here. In toddler, right, we don't try to catch our own exceptions. We just throw them from inside of ourselves because we don't know how to handle these situations. Right, so we just throw them back. Um, so I guess these try catches make sense. And then if you knew like you know something could go wrong in here, again you would wrap it once again inside of a try catch. Uh, if we give them something different, like instead of giving them a spanking, we give them vegetables. Just ignore them. Right, because, well, we didn't match with huge fit. We just matched with fit, so we just said that we ignored their, their problem. What would happen if I put this catch right here before this catch right here? I rearrange them. Right? What would happen if I moved this statement up to here? So I, I have it, it wouldn't throw. Anything else? All right, if I took this guy out from here and I stuffed him right here. Yes, right, because a huge fit is a fit. If a huge fit ever gets thrown, it matches with this guy right here. And so we would always ignore the child's crying regardless of whether a huge fit was thrown or just a normal fit was thrown because this type matches first. And you can see even down here, can I give us this warning? Exception of type huge fit reference will be caught by an earlier handler. This one up here. So we'd never be able to run this code. Does that make sense? So make sure that you do your exceptions from most specific to least specific when you're writing them. For example, if I put like the catch dot 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 right here is my very first thing. That may mean that's the only one that's ever going to be caught because it matches with absolutely everything.
Hmm? It's literally catch dot dot dot. <laughs> that means catch it, catch everything, but you don't know what it is. You just caught something. So it's really hard to recover from that. Any other questions? Not exceptions. Okay. Let's go to the vector that we did before. And what would some possible, what could possibly be some wrong things that we could do with our vector? Oh, up here, okay. What would be some possible wrong things here that we could do with our vector? Theoretically, it's possible to do too many values. It'd be a very large number, so we might have to have some exceptions about over allocating space. What else? Going out of bounds, right? That could cause a problem. It's probably one of the main ones. Uh, anything else? Trying to construct a vector with a negative number of elements probably should not be allowed, right? Like I want a vector that starts with negative 12 values, right? It's completely illegal, right? But someone could still enter that because we accept signed integers. So we would probably want to throw an exception if they did a bad value. Or if we like go over here to our um, iterators, could there be anything illegal that happens here? And in what method? Operator star could cause some problems when when it's what? Well, again, we don't we're not doing null over here, right? But operator star would cause some problems when the iterator was out of bounds, right? Because if you had the iterator be out of bounds, that could cause some issues. Uh, you could potentially also it depends on if you want to do this. Um, the operator plus plus could technically be illegal. Like if you're already out of bounds, plus plusing again might be considered to be illegal. Right? Or again, like doing like operator plus when it would take you out of bounds, that might also be considered illegal. But you might want to allow those as well. Like you can go as far as bounds, uh, uh, as far out of bounds as you want with your iterator as long as you don't dereference the iterator, right? So we might not, well, you could, depend on how you want to do things, put some exceptions here, but definitely here, dereferencing the iterator that's out of bounds. Uh, one thing that also that we've kind of noticed that you guys have been struggling with for the current homework assignment, the doubly linked list, is that when we talked about iterators, we did need something to keep track of what their position was at. And so here in our vector iterator, we used an integer just to keep track of our index. Now, this works great for a vector, but it's not ideal for every single type of iterator. And it's probably a terrible idea for your doubly linked list iterator. So don't have an integer keeping track of your position. Think about using something that's a little bit more useful to keep track of where you're at. So let's say we want to go and add these things in here, and I need to make a commit first. Um, and then we'll create a new branch so that we can try stuff out and not mess up what we have originally. So we might have a new branch called like with exceptions. And great, we're now on our new branch with exceptions, so we can go add them in. So over here, we might decide to add in a new C++ class, and it might just be called vector exception. 
And so normally, like when you're creating like exceptions for your particular class or your object, you want to have like a base exception that represents, okay, this is just an error coming from my project so that people can catch a generic exception from your project to be able to distinguish it between other exceptions. And then again, you can go more specific later on with the particular type. So over here, we're going to have our guy inherit from exception. So how can I publicly inherit from vector exception? Well, public exception. So now vector exception inherits from exception. And I'm going to have a protected member. It's going to be a string. Just like you saw before. Error string. And then we're going to need to public. Then we need to code override functions. We need to override what, because what is a purely virtual method. And so here we're just going to return error string dot c underscore stir. So all of our all of our exceptions that inherit from it are going to do this generic operation um, if they inherit from vector. And in general, this is a pretty easy way about going about doing it, because all we just have to do is have each child class fill in whatever the error is supposed to be. So I'm going to make a new class. So we might have a vector out of bounds error. So what should vector out of bounds error inherit from? Probably vector error, right? Because a vector out of bounds error is a vector error. Oops, I don't want to do it myself. Oops, I call this vector exception. All right, so this one right here, um, C line by default won't put on the no except, but we have to put it here so that it matches up with the signature of the what method. And then this guy, we need to say no except as well. We promise not to throw any exceptions and reporting what the error was, which kind of makes sense, right? If you're reporting the error, reporting the error shouldn't cause any errors. So vector out of bounds error. is going to publicly inherit from vector error. And so now we're going to need to have our, did we make this into a namespace at all? No, we didn't. Okay, that's good. So we're going to have our constructor. What should our constructor take in in order to be able to report the error? So if you were throwing this exception, when would you throw this exception? It's not a trick question. When you try to access a vector, but you go out of bounds. So what two things would probably be really useful to have in reporting this error? The index and the size of the vector, or just like the vector in general, which from the vector will take its size. So we'll have our vector error vector out of bounds error is going to accept a I'm going to do a or four declaration so class vector and remember vector is templated so template type name t so since our vector is templated do we need to template this exception We need to template our class since vector is templated. Yes? No? For those of you that said no, why don't we? For those of you who think yes, why do we?
Right, because like reporting this exception, we don't really care what the type of the vector is, right? What we do is not dependent on what the types that the vector contains. So our class won't be templated. But we do need to be able to receive vectors of different types. So this is something new that you guys haven't seen before. You can template just particular methods of a class, and not all of them. Or even in templated methods, you could template some of your methods over different methods. So here we're going to have template type name t. And then here we are going to take in a const vector of t reference vec. And what are you thinking about? Oh. Yeah. Triangles go here. Vec and then in int index. Right? So this particular method is templated, but not all of our methods need to be. For example, our what method is not templated. But since this method is templated, where does it need to go? It has to go into the header file. Right? The other thing that I'm going to add over here is I'm going to add some two protected members. Um, these would be something like uh, int vector size. And then we're also going to take in, um, have an int index accessed, right? And then we might provide some more, this is public. And then down here we might have, oops, something like that. Uh, code generate getters, vector size and index accessed. These can go in the, um, CVP file, that's perfectly fine. And again, these guys are here so that people, if they caught this particular um, exception, besides being able to report what the error was, they would be able to get some additional information out of it to do things. Again, we're not going to have a reference to the vector because it's unsafe like you saw before. That vector may not exist when we're doing this operation, like or in the accept clause. So we will generate him, but you have to go into the header file. Otherwise, you won't work correctly. And then down here, we will include vector.h. So over here, we should make the vector size be equal to vec dot size, and we should make the index we should make our index be equal to or their index x equal to index, and then we're going to need to report some errors. So I'm going to include string stream to make this a little bit easier. And we're also going to include string. So I might have an std colon colon string stream error writer. So I can write my error a little bit easier. And then I might do something like error writer equals uh, Vector square bracket index is out of bounds. This is error writer. Vector can own or er. 
So we were, you know, we put something sensible there for what the error is, right? You know, you try to access the error at this index, but this vector can only be indexed between here and here. And then we need to set our error string to be equal to what we just wrote there. So error string is equal to error writer dot stir. And that will copy the string over. You guys have any questions here? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, it should be vector size minus one. Correct. Any questions? So now let's throw this somewhere. So if we pop over here to vector, we now need to include vector out of bounds error. And so now over here at our at function, we might Create one more method over here. This guy might be protected. And it's going to be void verify inbounds uh, int index const. And so what this function should do is verify if this index is in bounds to access inside this vector. And if it's not, it should throw an exception, not a bounce error. So over here, we could say something like if index is less than zero or index is greater than or equal to size minus, uh, greater than or equal to size, right? What should we do? This is not good, so we should throw. Gosh. Throw a vector out of bounds error. Right? Who should we pass in as the vector that was tried to be accessed? Sorry, this, right? Because we want a reference. And then the index would be index. So now what we can do is the whole reason I put this here is so that I can make my life a little bit cleaner. So if I now go to the at, I can just do something like this. Verify inbounds pause. Fantastic. Verify inbounds pause. And that's all I need to add there. You don't have to see that ugly if and throw stuff in there. Uh, I don't need to put it in the square brackets because the square brackets call the ats. And the ats will then throw the exception if they're not in bounds. So you, like, the only way to make it run before would be to call it at the beginning of yourself. But there's, there's no, like, say, there's nothing that says, like, before this function gets called, always run this other function. The only way to make that happen is at the beginning of your function, run that function. Yeah. Say that again? So again, if the throw exception uh, is encountered, the return is not run, right? Because throw and return kind of like behave similarly in that they cause you to leave a function, but return returns the regular way. Throw goes back like in like not the regular way, it goes back in an exceptional way. Something bad happened here and I'm getting out. And remember that if a function that you call throws an exception, right? And that exception is not handled inside that function, it basically re-throws the exception again and outside of itself. And if you don't catch it, then you'll throw it too. And it'll keep propagating up until somebody catches it. Are there any other questions here? Um, one other place that we would probably like, like to check for this, uh, inserts a little bit different. We can't, like, insert needs to be checked. 
Um, but one of the issues here is that you are allowed to go at size for doing the insert. So we'd have to make some small modifications, right? Because you can insert at the very end of the vector to make it longer. Um, also, erase though would still need to be in bounds because if you weren't in bounds on an erase, that's undefined. So we could go down here and say something like verify in bounds. Pause. Yeah. Um, so if the type is different, then if it's implicitly implicitly castable to our T type, it will be cast to that. But if there is no implicit cast to our type, then the compiler is going to be like, I can't do that, and the code wouldn't compile. No, we don't have to have an exception because the code can't compile. The code cannot be turned into an executable if an object of that different type is not insertable. Like, like it, it doesn't matter because it's all based on types, right? When you got that user input, whether it was a string or an int or whatever, right, you had to go put it into an object of your type, right? And if that object is not convertible to a T, right, the compiler will be like, there is no function that exists to insert this, and that's an error at compile time, not at runtime. These exceptions that we're checking here are for errors at runtime after the code's been built. So, no, we don't need any exceptions for that because the compiler handles that kind of mistake for us. Uh, there are ways of adding compile time exceptions, but it's a lot more complicated, and we'll only get into that if we actually have time. Any other questions? So now what we might also want to do is over here, um, we'll skip doing these ones here, but if we pop back to main, and I now try to do something down here, say like, you know, give me v2 dot at 50, which is like way out of bounds. And I run this, and hopefully I didn't make any mistakes because of the compiling, templating stuff. It should have seg faulted. E2 at 50 actually inbounds? Let's see what's happening here. Wait, we're getting a segmentation fault here? Oh, I know what the problem was. No, I accepted a reference here. A signal, it actually says signal unknown. 
So apparently, here we're on push back, push back called insert, insert called at, oh, okay. So we actually didn't even get down to that line of code because the, uh, the vector, um, the problem over here is in insert, actually. And I saw that by looking at the stack trace. So over here, when we accept an index, right, we attempt to do at i equals at i minus 1. Um, but the problem here is since we haven't increased the number of elements yet, do that at the bottom, this causes us to go out of bounds because we start at size. So at i is out of bounds, right? And so that's going to give us a seg fault. Um, Easy fix for right now, and I don't like doing this, but we only have a couple minutes, is contents, square bracket i. That won't call at, and i minus 1 is in bounds. Or there's still some other error that I need to double check with because it's probably still getting out of bounds here and I'm not sure where this is happening. Again, it's still happening in insert. Oh, when we're inserting the back. So if I just switch this around. Maybe it'll work. There we go. So now it's out of bounds, and we're able to avoid that problem. I have a weird question. Or I, I don't have a weird question. I see something weird. Codathon uh, kicked me out. I, I cleared my cookies like two days ago, mm -hmm. and then I tried to log in today. And, it and it tells you. me that my email is not confirmed. Can I just sign in with Google instead? <laughs> so I, like, I haven't signed up with Google. Though. So no, but if you sign in with Google and you go through and you enter in your like ah, UC Davis, Davis stuff, um, your whatever okay, you are at UC that. Davis, that should work. That's weird. Because I, I just re um, I tried to reset my password and mm -hmm. the link came fine. So it was so the, the email is in the system. Okay. I'm I, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so earlier when we uh, when we were getting an error in, and you ran the debugger and it said the signal was lost, what does that exactly mean when the signal is lost? Well, the signal was question, question, question mark. So it means it received some signal, but it didn't know what it was. And we could kind of like if we want to kind of like re-trigger that error. Yeah. I get there all, all the time, and I wouldn't know what to do. So let's say I throw it through the debugger again. Yeah. Wait for it to rebuild. Yeah. Okay, great. Oh, so I can yeah. say I have, like, signal unknown, yeah. right? And I'm kind of like, well, hmm, this is a little bit suspicious. Right. So I'm kind of like, okay, well, where is this coming from? And the reason why it's kind of giving me this error is that I threw an exception that propagated all the way back out to main, and I didn't catch it. And it's saying, like, this is the place that threw the exception. It's right here, so obviously. And then I can kind of look, look where this came from. It came from at, which was called from insert, which happened from pushback. Okay. Right, because when we push back, we're going to end up inserting out of bounds. And we can see here, this is the line of code where the at was called that eventually threw the exception. So, um, and because this one wasn't caught at all, yeah. that's why um, the error is getting reported here. Right. So when the signal is unknown, it just means that something's messed up in your code, like before. Generally, generally, like the signal unknown means like segmentation fault or exception was thrown. Okay. That was not handled. Got it. Got so it. Thank you. Just kind of trace back to there and kind of like, okay, what's going on here? Right. Okay. And then so for me to like fix this, uh -huh. um, it was actually insert. And so I just had to change that from, you know, pause to be at contents again, because yeah. that doesn't do any checking. Mm -hmm. And so now if I go and do this, 
it's not going to crash anymore, like you saw, and it'll print stuff out. And then we were able to catch our error. But if I get rid of that, like, try accept code that I had, yeah. down here where I was purposely trying to go out of bounds, here, and are you going to give your announcement this afternoon? You wanted to give an announcement, yeah, yeah? Oh, About yeah, the yeah. Banquet? We, mm. already, we already did, like, uh, five minutes with last time. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. So if I do this one again, if I get rid of the try catch, um, it's not going to, like, show anything here. It's going to be like, oh, I kind of finished. <gasps> but it's not right. It didn't actually finish. It didn't finish normally. The exception was thrown. Mm -hmm. And if I go back here and I rent to debugger, hey, you can see something bad is, oops, that's not where I want to be breaking oh. at. Resume. Uh... Not sure why we have a break point here, but continue on, please. Continue on. So now we're like down here. And if I try to go past this break point, which is the one that I was interested in, you can see we got that exact oh, same error because I was throwing okay. an exception, mm -hmm. but I wasn't catching it and handling got it. Got it. Got it. Thank you. If I throw that, you know, handling back in, and then we won't give me that error in the debugger. Okay, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did um, present like before class started, okay. and it was it was uh, good hopefully people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, and it's free for professors if you were interested in coming to the right banquet. Okay, awesome, thank you. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, in a situation where, say, looks oh, exception at the same time, like not just the most one, do okay. we have to use comparison? Wait, so, so, the question was what again? Like, if we, if we have exception, kind of a uh, inner and we want to pick not just outside So like so you're trying to so like you're trying to catch some exception, right? And so your question is what happens if I want to catch multiple exceptions of different types, but I want to do the exact same thing for each one of them? Is that what we're getting at? So if if, the, if that's true, right, and, you know, there's an inheritance level, like A, like, you know, a, like B inherits from A, C inherits from B, right? Uh, you could just catch A's, right, because it also catches B's and C's, and then you do the exact same thing, because you said you want to do the exact same thing, right? Because if you catch the base class, you'll catch all the children as well, right? But you won't have access to any of the, the child information. error message. So now, now the question is, well, what happens if they're like inherited from different type? Like they're not, there's no inheritance. Then you have to explicitly catch each one, and then do the exact same thing. And because you're doing the exact same thing, you might want to um, uh, write a function that you just call in each one of those exceptions, so that you don't have to keep rewriting the exact same code. And, like, I wouldn't probably recommend, like, super nesting all the tries. Like, let's say, again, like, C inherits from B, B inherits from A, A inherits, you know, or, like, there. So you wouldn't, like, do, like, three levels of tries where you catch the innermost C, and then C rethrows to catch B, and then B rethrows to catch A. Because it's going to look a bit nightmarish. Um, but, again, like, if the child overrides the method, you probably don't want to be doing what the parent does. Right? But if you did want to do what the parent did, right, remember you can call the parent's method where you could do like, you know, I have my child exception. You could do like child exception dot parent name colon colon method. And that will call the parent's version of that method. Right, which we kind of saw when we were working with like our professor that inherited from the researchers and the instructors. How we would call like an instructor method or a researcher method. Uh, instead of just like you know, letting whatever happens happens, so like dot parent name whatever. So you could just say like you know child dot method, child dot b colon colon method, child you know c child dot e or child dot a colon colon method, and that would call each one of them, assuming there was that inheritance there. But if there's no inheritance there, you kind of have to catch each one individually, and then throw and then, or do each one individually and then do the exact same thing that you're going to do every single time. Um, and you couldn't template your catch. Also, if you maybe kind of like, well, maybe I can template my catch statement over different types. Can't do that either. Um,
I mean, like, so, like, normally when you'd have, like, nested try-catches, it does happen, and it's, gen like, normally that would be, like, you're trying to do some, normally, like, the nested try-catches happen because you call some function that could throw some error, and so you wrap it in a try-catch, and that function then calls some other function that could throw some error, so that's wrapped in a try-catch. You normally wouldn't see two tries in there nested. In the same function but it could happen if you had to like do some code here at the it just normally probably wouldn't happen in a single function where you had two tries nested inside of each other I'm trying to think of when i would do that yeah So why don't you, because you want to catch the errors closer to where they happen, because you have more information to deal with them there. Potentially. But yeah, because like, you know, like if we're like 50 calls deep and that throws an exception, and I'm trying to like figure out what happened back at main, that's really tough because I've now like lost all that information of where that exception came from and what the path was to get there. Whereas, like, if I'm inside that function, I'm able to probably have more, uh, better error recording details at that point and be able to hopefully better resolve it. But sometimes you don't, so you throw an exception again or you throw a different type of exception and whoever calls you is now responsible for handling that. Hmm? Yeah. So, so the error says that 